I'm Cheryl Ackeson at NATO Allied Air Command in Ramstein, Germany. I'm Cheryl Ackeson in San Jose, California. I'm Cheryl Ackeson on the Texas-Mexico border. Scenes from our reporting as we wrap up season eight of Full Measure. This week, we highlight some of your favorite stories and ours. I refused to get the vaccine. There was COVID and the trickle-down impact of the disease and decisions. Two pharmacies refused to fill the Salir's ivermectin prescription. We examined when government oversight becomes an overreach. Surveillance video shows FBI agents weapons drawn surrounding the Texas home of Trennis Evans. These armed agents, you know, is there a gun drawn and they're running into the house and running around and yell, FBI, FBI. We focused on America's greatest competitor and threat. Here in Panama, you can really see it. The concern is that the larger presence China has here, the more control it also has. With regard to China possibly using the moon as a military strategic <coughs> destination. And they usually do what they say they're going to do in space. And we examined the cost and controversies surrounding energy. There's been a fast and remarkable turnaround in Europe's green agenda. They're ramping back up on fossil fuel. We are some of the few outsiders allowed hundreds of feet down into this mine shaft in search of cobalt. This week, our special end of the season roundtable edition of Full Measure. Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Ackeson, and this is our special year-end edition, bringing together, as we do every season, our Full Measure correspondents for a look back at some of our favorite reports and yours, too. In this, our eighth year on the air, we devoted a lot of time to important stories of people who too often aren't heard in today's news media environment. One of our most watched reports was our investigation where we heard from a brave group of doctors and other medical pros from the first hospital in the U.S. to require COVID vaccines. You did not want to get vaccinated? No. Dr. Venu Julapali is among an outspoken group of medical professionals once affiliated with Houston Methodist. Methodist was the first hospital system in the nation to require COVID vaccines. I refused to get the, the vaccine. I spoke out on social media saying vaccine mandates were wrong. And I said, I don't want to take so it. I ultimately gave my notice and I went somewhere else. And I was suspended and then terminated. It's rare to find medical professionals from such a prominent hospital system speaking on camera on the topic, punished, they say, for using independent medical judgment, which they consider a hallmark of sound medicine. Dr. Julapali started an email group of more than a thousand of his colleagues to discuss and debate the policies. Many, he said, would only share their true feelings with him in private. The level of fear among our colleagues, among the medical staff, in terms of expressing their opinion, whatever it was, because they were afraid that they were going to be retaliated against by the institution, Houston Methodist, was off the charts and continues to be off the charts. There's still fallout at hospitals around the country from the firings and controversy over COVID vaccine mandates. On another topic related to COVID, we also heard from someone challenging the controversial practice that emerged during the pandemic of pharmacies refusing to fill legal prescriptions for coronavirus. In the small town of Albert Lee, Minnesota, where the Saliers live, two pharmacies refused to fill the Saliers ivermectin prescription. That included the local Walmart. It was the pharmacist himself, and he talked to my wife because I was kind of incoherent. And I remember her walking into the bedroom, and I heard her say, you can't do that. You can't just not fill a prescription because you feel like you don't want to. And I could hear her responding to his answer of, yes, I can, and I won't fill it. Pharmacists do have the right to use their professional discretion to turn away prescriptions. But ivermectin proved more than a fringe hope promoted by a handful of doctors. 
According to CDC, by November of 2021, more than 377,000 people a month were being prescribed ivermectin, a 24-fold increase compared to before COVID. Nobody we spoke to could point to an instance prior to the pandemic where so many people were blocked from getting legally prescribed medicine. The mass refusals have sparked a national debate over patient rights and whether pharmacists should overrule a doctor's judgment. We even ended up with our doctor becoming more firm and saying, no, you, you need to fill this, and the pharmacist at Walmart hung up on her. So you Bill Salir says he turned to desperate Walmart measures. He consulted their doctor and their veterinarian, translated the horse formulation into a human dosage, and... We squirted horse paste into applesauce and down the hatch it went. Both Salir and his wife feel the ivermectin cured them. Though many studies have said ivermectin and other off-narrative therapies are effective for COVID, some public health officials dispute that and say they could be dangerous. And perhaps one of our most popular stories is the report we did on the January 6th riots, with the FBI using armed SWAT teams to arrest protesters who committed, if anything, a nonviolent misdemeanor, and an FBI whistleblower who refused to go along with the heavy-handed tactics. FBI! Yes? Yeah. Right, you can't step out with us, please, sir. March 4th, 2021. Surveillance video shows FBI agents' weapons drawn surrounding the Texas home of Trennis Evans. Looked like a dozen agents around your house. Oh, it's a lot more than that, yeah. So there was 20-plus agents there. They had snipers. They had vehicles to block it off the street. I mean, it was insane. And your 13-year-old son is out on the front deck with his yeah. hands up. Yeah. That's his son, blue shirt, hands up. Considering the presence of a small army from the FBI, you might think Evans was a vicious criminal, armed and dangerous. In fact, he had no history of violence. This was his crime. He's in the yellow hat, climbing through a window to enter the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. Stephen Friend is among more than a dozen FBI agents reported to be blowing the whistle on the agency's alleged political bias. He told me he was suspended after refusing to take part in SWAT raids of nonviolent January 6th suspects. What did you think was so wrong about the raids? I felt that there was definitely a, a um, a harder hand in the way that the arrests and the searches were going to be carried out, uh, regardless of the individual's involvement in January 6th. By the way, Stephen Friend resigned from his FBI position in February after they refused to assign him work, quit paying him, and rejected his request to accept outside employment. And Scott Thuman and Lisa Fletcher are here to join us for our last episode. Thank you for another fantastic year of reporting from mm -hmm. around the world. And when we come back after a break, you're both going to tell us about some of the reporting we've all done on one of our greatest adversaries, China. Yeah, and how they're investing billions of dollars in an area that some people say is a little too close for comfort for the United States. So we're going to take you there and we'll show you how America may have taken its eye off the prize and then China moved in. Yeah, and we're going to talk about China's determination not stopping here on Earth, how they're looking at the moon and using strategic resources on the moon as their own. All right, that sounds great. Those stories of China's impact on America and beyond, up next. Welcome back to our year-end roundtable on Full Measure. China continues to be a key theme on Full Measure. We believe the U.S.-China dynamic is one of the most impactful stories we cover. There was a bit of a twist with one story that we did about Chinese-American scientists suffering a case of mistaken identity, with the FBI wrongly accusing them of being spies. Physicist Zhao Jing Shi says his rude awakening came early one morning in May of 2015. These armed agents, you know, is there a gun drawn and they're running into the house and running around and yell, FBI, FBI. And uh, so they ordered my wife and uh, two daughters coming out of their bedrooms with their hands raised. And, and it was very, very scary. The FBI accused Xi of sending colleagues in China sensitive information about a superconductor device called a pocket heater. Temple University removed him as chair of its physics department, and his nightmare was officially underway. But it turns out the FBI was mixed up. 
actually Xi's communications with his Chinese colleagues were disclosed, perfectly legal, and had nothing to do with pocket heaters. How did this impact your life? Oh, that's, um, that's dramatic. That's significant. Most people do not realize that when the government charged somebody, it's not necessarily true, right? So that's uh, very damaging. The case against Xi was ultimately dropped. He has a lawsuit pending against the government. Now, that's not to say there aren't some very real threats from China. There was an estimate that China is stealing up to $600 billion in U.S. trade secrets every year. And it's challenging the U.S. and around the globe in terms of its influence and what we need to really worry about, which you reported on, Scott. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we decided to follow this story when we started reading more and more reports out of Latin America about massive Chinese investment there at a time when the U.S. was really starting to scale back a bit and then perhaps woke up to the situation a bit too late. In Colombia's capital, Bogota, they are digging deep to create the city's first metro system and doing so in just five years' time. A project this massive, of this scale and size, currently the largest underway in the entire country, goes a long way in a place like Colombia, where they say it'll create about 17,000 jobs. But take a closer look at those shiny new rail cars, and you'll see who is helping with all that hiring. The train is Chinese, and so are the companies that won the bids on the $4.5 billion deal to build the metro's first line. I think China has always have had like interest in our geographical position, in our economic and political stability. So it like makes Colombia like the point of attack attraction to China, from, to China. China has a lot of money. Yeah. So why is this happening? Partially because China tried this in Africa, saw it work, and just kept moving. And then the other reason experts tell me is because. The U.S. was so focused on what was going on in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and investing so much time and resources there that they just kind of ignored our nearest neighbors. Well, Lisa, you reported how China's influence goes far beyond just Earth. Oh, right. They've already launched their own space station, and they plan to develop resources on the moon and claim them as their own, both on the lunar landscape, and then they want to strategically harness solar power. Good descent rate. Splashdown. The December splashdown of the most powerful rocket NASA has ever made, Artemis, was the successful conclusion to a mission laying the groundwork to take Americans back to the moon and beyond. Our biggest rival is putting a tremendous amount of energy into launching a new space station, building bigger rockets, and developing plans that make ours seem a little small. When I met NASA Administrator Bill Nelson just before Artemis launched, he was keenly alert to China's geopolitical plans for the moon. Since China has a very good space program, and they say they're going to land on the moon, and they usually do what they say they're going to do in space, so is it beyond the realm of possibility that they land on the South Pole where the water is, if there's water? There's rocket fuel, hydrogen and oxygen. The Chinese get there, it's always the possibility that they say, you stay out, this is our exclusive zone. The Pentagon has estimated that China will surpass U.S. capabilities in space by 2045, which is why there's a real push by some members of the military and Congress to further fund Space Force. Sources we spoke with say they're not underestimating China's ability to use their space program for both economic and military advantage. Something really to watch. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And when we come back, one of the biggest and most important controversies facing us over energy in America. Whether it's the price of gas, the precarious nature of the oil industry, or green energy failures, the forces that power us are a critical issue, and we devoted a lot of attention to the controversy surrounding that. On my trip to Europe, I was surprised to learn that some of the world's leaders in green energy are reluctantly returning to fossil fuel in a big way. 
Europe was rationing power and on the cusp of shortages and blackouts, with experts there saying their experience is a warning of what may come here as the U.S. follows in their green energy footsteps. The fact is there's been a fast and remarkable turnaround in Europe's green agenda. They're ramping back up on fossil fuel. Greece, the Netherlands and the Czech Republic have already reopened shuttered coal plants and resumed coal mining where it had been halted. Germany has authorized restarting 27 coal plants. David Cowling of King's College University in London. I think that's a very tangible thing if they are reopening coal plants that may look like failure. Absolutely. And I don't know if there's any way to explain it away, um, because how can you? You know, the coal is regarded as one of the worst polluters. And for a country that has been at the forefront of, of wanting to advance the cause of green energy, to have to reopen those coal mines is an admission of defeat. It was a singular event that exposed serious fault lines in Europe's ambitious climate change plans. The war in Ukraine has laid bare poor planning, unrealistic goals, and reliance on an unreliable partner, Russia. And Lisa, I learned more from your report on liquid natural gas than I ever knew before. It was very eye-opening. Well, we were trying to figure out why the cost of natural gas was up about a third last year for most Americans when the supply is so plentiful here in the United States. Along the coast of Texas and Louisiana, America has become a global gas station at the time of an energy crisis. Thanks to ports like this, the U.S. has in the last few years become the third biggest exporter of natural gas in the world. And at a critical time, with the war in Ukraine upending Europe's traditional supply of gas from Russia, the U.S. is stepping up to keep the lights and heat on in struggling places. A number of countries, Germany and Italy in particular, relied on Russian volume for almost half of their natural gas requirements. As a cleaner burning fossil fuel, natural gas replacing coal-fired power generation is seen by many as a bridge to a future dominated by renewable energy. But there's a problem. While U.S. gas production has reached record levels, consumers are also seeing records in terms of the prices they pay, with bills rising more than 20 percent above where they were this time last year. The Biden administration's focus on renewable energy has, according to some in the fossil fuel industry, meant that not enough has been done to incentivize oil and gas production. Another problem is a nearly 100-year-old law called the Jones Act. It restricts transport of cargo on ships between U.S. ports unless the ships are U.S. owned, crewed, registered, and built. No ships like that exist for LNG, which is why we can't ship natural gas from Texas to New England on a tanker. And instead, places like Boston have to buy from overseas. And then you, Scott, reported a fascinating story, another one that has a China tie how minerals we desperately need here in the U.S. for practically everything we do are largely made or mined in China. Sure, and we're talking about phones, laptops, electric vehicles. Most of those batteries, among other things, need cobalt. The U.S. sits on a pretty good amount of it, but we weren't doing much with them. We weren't mining it, and that made us more reliant on China. But in the past decade, there was an awakening things started to change. The U.S. realized it needed to do something, started mining, opened a mine for the first time in a very long time, and we got rare access to see it. We are some of the few outsiders allowed hundreds of feet down into this mine shaft in search of cobalt. We're building a big spiral that'll spiral down. This opening then allows us to get over to the ore body so we can extract where the cobalt is. Right now, the biggest global producer of cobalt is the Democratic Republic of Congo in the middle of Africa. Though the big mines were once American-owned, China now controls 70% of the production. And globally, China now refines 80% of the world's cobalt and 60% of another key battery ingredient, lithium. For America, now way behind, this is a race to catch up. And at the White House, 
worries have been mounting. As for that mine, they think over about seven years of work, they can pull 4 million pounds of cobalt. That is enough for 2.8 million electric vehicles. Very awesome. Don't go away. We're back in a moment with a few highlights from our travels that haven't been seen on TV before. Back at Full Measure, and as we have traveled the world, we've really gotten a window on many fascinating cultures, scenics, and experiences, and we decided to close out today with some of those moments not seen on TV. For example, <laughs> while reporting on the landmark gun control law in San Jose, California, I got the chance to try my marksmanship at the municipal gun range. What about you, Scott? Well, we were taking that drive to the cobalt mine that we showed you earlier. We were on our way from Utah to Idaho, and we stopped at this fantastic scene called the Craters of the Moon National Park. It's so unique. They told us that in the late 60s, NASA astronauts explored it while training to visit the moon. It's off the beaten path, but it is really worth a visit. That is so cool. Mm -hmm. And speaking of NASA, Lisa, you have shared with me that you are sort of a space geek. I am too. Yes. So tell yes, me Yes, we're more. kindred spirits yes, in yes. that regard. Anybody who's watched the show knows that I love doing stories on space. We had another chance to shoot at Kennedy Space Center this year. It was amazing. I was there for the first launch attempt of Artemis. It's amazing. <laughs> start. Three. Two, one, boosters in ignition, and liftoff of Artemis One. But it always reminds me that this job is incredible, right? Because we get to do things that, you know, stimulate our natural interests and our curiosity, That's and so it true. makes it even more fun. Yeah, we're all very lucky. Yeah. yeah. And we're lucky to have you guys reporting for us. I know the viewers feel that way. And that makes it a wrap for our eighth season on Full Measure. Hard to believe we started this program yeah. in 2015, and we never run out of great ideas for original investigative reporting. So we're pleased to announce we will be back for season nine this fall. Yay. You can watch some of our best programs over the summer while we're off traveling, researching, and shooting new stories for you. And be sure to check out our new and improved website, fullmeasure.news. Again, thanks to Scott and Lisa and to the entire small but very talented Full Measure team that works tirelessly to bring meaningful, good journalism to you every week when it seems to be in such short supply. And thanks, Bat. See you in September.